point to later on, but uh, we'll go ahead and, and kick off and get started. Uh, welcome everyone who is viewing this webinar. Um, this is the third and final webinar we're doing for the students in the College of Arts and Sciences and across the university, um, showcasing AU alumni who graduated in the last Great Recession and who have success stories and ways that they survived job searching at that time and tips to share. Um, we're going to start just quickly with some housekeeping items about how this is going to work today. Um, so as you can tell, if you are a, an attendee, cameras and microphones have been disabled um, so that we can just focus on having our uh, speakers talk today. If you have any questions for the panel, type them into the chat bar at any time. Um, we have uh, Samantha Mitchell from the Career Center joining me as well, who is monitoring those questions and um, will chime in if I miss something. Um, but we're gonna start, we'll get started here as you can see with welcome introductions. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the Career Center before we get into some um, just general questions for the panelists and then questions from the audience. Uh, my name is Nathan Slusher. I'm the Director of Career Education and Outreach in the Career Center. And I'm pleased to showcase this fantastic group of alumni um, in putting together a panel around arts. Uh, as I was talking to the panelists earlier, we wanted to be conscientious to represent um, a variety of career paths that people who pursue um, arts either as studies or as careers afterwards can pursue. And so I think we have been very successful at, uh, with the panelists that we have identified. Um, so thank you all for being here and taking the time to give back to the AU community in this way. Um, I'm just gonna give a quick plug for the Career Center while I can. Uh, we are here, we're open. We're virtual. Uh, we've been meeting with students virtually since March. We've been hosting events like this virtually since March. Um, and we are planning to do a whole new series of webinars throughout the summer that we will start marketing next week about job searching around a recession. And if you saw the news yesterday, we are now officially in, it's recognized as a recession, not just an economic downturn. Um, so, we are trying to do what we can to help uh, boost student energy and excitement around job searching and what can be considered a challenging time. So we have a series of webinars coming up to help you if you are job searching now and um, advisors are available and taking appointments now. So um, even as this webinar is going on, you can log into Handshake and make an appointment reservation. Uh, okay, I think that's all I have to say. Um, I'm going to now transition to introducing our panelists. Um, and, well, actually letting our panelists introduce themselves, talk a little bit about uh, their current roles. Um, and as we were saying at the beginning, um, maybe for the sake of flow, I'll just start and I'll kind of pose one question at a time so that we make sure we're, we're addressing all those points if that's okay, all right. Um, on my screen, the person in the top left corner is Vishal. So I'm just gonna turn it over to you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your, your current job. And um, we'll get into some of the specifics that what you did when you graduated in the next question. Great. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. Um, I am Vishal Vaidya, and I graduated from AU in 2009. And currently I live in New York City and I am a performer and a voice coach. So uh, I work on plays, musicals, a lot of musicals, um, concerts, and I teach voice. That is what I do. Thank you, Vishal. Uh, next we'll go to Sarah. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Olin. Um, I graduated with a graphic design major in 2010, 10 years ago. Um, I am living in New York and I'm currently working at Condé Nast um, as the design director of Glamour and Allure. Um, I've been there for two and a half years. Um, I oversee a team of three designers and I work across print and digital. Thanks, Sarah. 
Mia. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Mia Bronco. Um, I'm the director of education at a nonprofit in Boston, Massachusetts called Open Door Arts. Um, I graduated from AU with a degree in musical theater in 09 with Vishal. Um, if you don't know Vishal, you should Google him because he's incredibly talented. Um, so, uh, Open Door Arts, uh, we believe that our shared cultural community is stronger when it represents all people, and our primary focus is to increase access, participation, and representation of people with disabilities in the arts. Um, we do that through four initiatives, uh, professional development for cultural institutions around disability rights and inclusion, community convening, uh, we run two gallery spaces that promote art work done by artists with disabilities, and our largest program is the Cool Schools program, which stands for Creative Outlook on Learning. Um, and we have a staff of 15 to 20 teaching artists who we partner up with classroom teachers to develop arts integrated um, learning experiences that promote inclusion and support uh, students' academic, social, emotional, and artistic growth through multiple art forms, uh, all art forms. Um, and those are the programs that I run. Thank you. Thank you all again for being here. As you can tell, we have an incredible panel um, doing many, many exciting things. Uh, so we're gonna just kind of jump right into it. Um, as I said earlier, uh, yesterday we were officially recognized by the US government as being in a recession and you all graduated during a recession um, between you know, 10 and 12 years ago. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about your own experiences. Uh, how did you organize your post-graduation job search? When did you start? Um, who did you network with? How long were you searching if you were looking for a full-time job? Did you start in it in, with any short-term projects? If you had to pursue a plan B, did you later come back to plan A? And how did you cope with the stress of searching for a job and maintain a, a positive mindset? Those kind of like the, the big, big stuff, we're just gonna jump right into it. And um, I think we'll just go in the same order if that's okay. Turn it over to you, Michelle. All right. Um, so with what I do, it's all freelance, short-term work. Um, uh, 12 years ago, or yeah, 11 years ago when I graduated, I didn't know uh, what the gig economy was. I don't know if that was even a term when we graduated. Um, but I, um, I, I'm always sort of looking for jobs. That's kind of what I have to do. Um, and I think emerging from college in a recession kind of prepared me for that with my day job searches. You know, I, as an artist, you kind of have to make sure you can get by so that you can um, do the work you want, the, the sort of project-based work you want. Um, when I graduated, I had, I was pretty lucky. I had a, my work lined up for the rest of the year, which as an actor is like uh, kind of all you can hope for. Um, and I was really lucky. I had throughout school, I had been doing theater uh, in the DC area. So I had met and networked with a lot of people and um, also within the AU community. And so the job search for me is auditioning. And I was able to do that while I was in school, starting really in the last semester. Um, I would like leave class a lot to go audition or, or submit videos, or um, we had people come to AU, I think to help with audition prep and we got to meet casting directors. And it was also lucky because we had people at AU that we, um, knew that were in the theater community, uh, people like Carl Coppola, who is not with us right now at this meeting. Um, but I, uh, yeah, so that's networking to me is the most important part of <clears throat> job searching with what I do. And I was lucky because I already had a network set up. So I would just <clears throat> remind you that being a part of the AU community and the DC community, uh, means that you already have a network. So if you are nervous about that, you already know people. 
Um, yeah, so I, I was wondering if I should even be on this panel because I didn't have much of a job search after school. I had, um, I had a previous internship that kind of turned into a full-time job right away. So um, that was extremely lucky that someone was leaving and I was in the right place at the right time. But I feel like I've been looking for and applying for jobs ever since. <laughs> um, I've had a ton of jobs already and um, my other friends from AU who are working more in like politics and international relations are commenting on that. You know, why are you always changing jobs? And I think that's kind of what you have to do um, to, or what I felt I've had to do to stay fulfilled um, in the arts um, and just keep pushing myself. So um, I've been searching for jobs while I had full-time jobs. Um, and I think, I guess, I think reaching out to your network is huge and reaching out outside of your network is also really important. Um, I think not being afraid to reach out to a stranger um, has been really helpful to me because often people respond. Um, people are just people and, um, you know, they're happy to help and hear from you. Um, and I also think that the AU community is stronger than I would have thought. I think there's a special bond, especially working in the arts when there are, you know, we didn't go to NYU or whatever, like schools that are more known for it. So I think when you find someone else that went there, you kind of already like them. Um, at least that's how I feel. I found out recently that there are two people um, at my current job who also went to AU and we immediately like became best friends. Um, so I think just, um, you know, we can get into job boards and stuff like that, but um, finding a more personal approach has always been helpful for me. Um, and with a little Googling, you can probably find anyone's email. Okay, thank you. Mia. Um, yeah, I'll just jump off what Sarah kind of uh, threw out there in her last few comments, which is that uh, finding a, a personal, um, authentic kind of baseline for your job search is such an important place to start from because it just feels better. Um, job searching is kind of the worst um, because it's very vulnerable and it's very... Um, uh, it feels like a huge vacuum because you often don't get responses or you're not sure what other people think about you and it can be very, very intimidating. Um, when I graduated, um, I um, did a lot of things, but essentially I had 11 jobs for a while. Um, some of which, you know, were rotating on like a, a one once a month basis. Um, but what that did for me was it allowed me to um, dive into opportunities that I didn't necessarily know if I would enjoy or if I would want to do. And that was a huge jumping off point for figuring out what I did want to do in my career. Um, when I graduated, I thought I was really going to pursue uh, acting and musical theater and, and music and um, those aspects. Um, and after uh, a number of different jobs. I got to experience the corporate world. I got to experience nonprofits, large and small. I got to experience startups. I got to experience community projects, um, national projects, all sorts of different experiences that made me realize that though I loved performing and always want, want that to be a part of my life, what really, um, what I thought about before going to bed and what I got excited for in the morning was community-based projects and specifically working with youth and working on projects that were raising up voices that are often uh, marginalized. So that's what led me into um, education. Um, but back to the kind of networking question, um, obviously it's very important and uh, leaning on the AU community is a really, really great place to start because that's what you're launching off from and eat that humble pie, reach out and ask for help from as many people as you can think of 
um, and be inspired by uh, how many people are willing to reach back out and help you. Um, but also, I hate networking. I just, it makes me so anxious. Um, but what kind of made that shift for me was not thinking, like rebranding it for myself and thinking about it as relationship building, because I love people and I love friends and socializing, but I hate the inauthenticity of networking. Um, so finding ways to be very strategic in your networking, knowing a couple people, a couple organizations that you're really genuinely interested in knowing more about um, can make it seem less um, vacuous. <laughs> um, if you have specific questions and specific people, use your networks to find access to those people or Google their email, as Sarah said, um, and, and just, just go for it. But find that personal stance um, and uh, place of inquiry uh, that you can then figure out a plan to fulfill. That's great. You literally took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say that I also like to try to rebrand it for students and call it relationship building because it, it, it is much more authentic or feels much more authentic when you think of it that way. And given the state of the world and how most connections these days are done virtually, um, I think it creates an opportunity for a more one-on-one, -on -one, you know, even though it's not in person, uh, rather than attending a networking event where you're trying to sneak in and get, get up next to somebody you want to meet, this actually creates the opportunity for you to have that direct connection with people. Uh, you all um, segued quite nicely into some actionable advice for graduating students, uh, so thank you. And um, you all talked about networking, uh, Mia, most recently, but I wondered uh, if I could follow up with you, Vishal, to talk a little bit you're in a very different kind of um, career path from Mia and even Sarah, who are, have worked some more traditional job settings. If you could talk about um, networking from your perspective in kind of like gig economy, um, your experience doing that, what advice do you have? How do you have a story of how those connections actually worked to your favor when you, at the time, didn't see that coming. Um, yeah, I mean, I think maybe I didn't, I think I used to operate from a place of fear and I've always had a pretty large network. The big, a big shift to me was, um, for me, was actually only a couple of years ago realizing that I wanted to sort of level up, um, not necessarily like, I don't know, the art, or, well, level up the art I was making, not necessarily like monetarily, because that's not fulfilling. You know, that's, if you're not, if you're going to go in for the money, don't, don't go into the theater. Um, but the the big shift for me was I actually, the, this shift from calling it networking to, to I, I call it just connecting. And um, my sort of psych, uh, the way I psych myself out is I just pretend people are already my friends. Um, so like I do, um, you know, you have to constantly stay in touch with people. And so I do quarterly, I make myself do quarterly emails to every composer, casting director, director I know, and just do a little, Hey, this is what I'm up to something professional, something personal, nothing, you know, if you pretend that they're already your friend, then it doesn't feel as eager or green or I need you for a job, it then feels like we're more equal, which we're equal, we're all people. So you're just, you know, you're just reaching out as friends. Um, that's been the big thing for me. And um, I mean, just time, time, you know, allowing yourself the grace of time and knowing that you will, if you don't feel like you have a network of people, you still know what you want to do. So give yourself a really cr clear, uh, sort of focus of what you want to do and allow that to be your compass, um, knowing that that'll change and that people will come into your life that will give you opportunities you might not have thought of. Yeah. Can I, can I follow up and ask um, for people who just aren't in 
practice of doing this, you had a great example talking about your quarterly check-ins with certain people. How do you operationalize that? Um, I think people could benefit from hearing tips. How do you think about that when you think about approaching that? And what do you do on a quarterly basis to make sure you're, you're doing that and keeping track with the right people? Yeah. So I have a list. Um, actually, my, I have managers that made me, when I signed with them, have a list of every casting director I've been in for, what I auditioned for for them, was I given the job? Um, and that is really helpful because basically my job as an actor is to, uh, is to interview is to audition. So I go on thousands of auditions a year, maybe not thousands, hundreds. Um, but, you know, and usually you don't get the job, but that's not, that, that, that not getting the job is not the same as rejection. It just means you didn't get the job. So you could have still made a contact from that. People still remember you. The things that I try to give myself sort of like goals, like what are actual updates that mean something to me so that I'm not just saying like, I did this cool thing, you know? Um, that language, I, I wish I had that sort of insight 10 years ago when I was first doing those cold emails um, because I was so scared and I was like, you know, operating from this place of almost formal academic formality that is not needed in my field and isn't personal and isn't, um, you know, grounded in reality. So putting my own, you know, leading from the heart has helped me and I give myself sort of, if I have, you know, you're constantly having to update your content as a creative. So I try to give them some new content, whether it be a video I've done or, um, you know, new photos I've taken or whatever. And then I do, um, I'll try to have those bullet points and then also do something personal to them. Like, oh, I saw you cast this show that I saw um, or oh, I really loved seeing you at this audition or whatever, to remind them of who I am and that I know their work. Great, thanks. And Sarah, you talked about um, switching jobs a number of times and, and pretty regularly and, and talked about um, also your connections when you find other AU alumni. So I didn't know if you wanted to expand a little bit just on how you have seen looking back uh, with the, the power of 2020 hindsight, the ties that your network played in, in your roles of switching jobs and finding other opportunities? Sure. Um, I will say that my current job, um, my boss at my current job has been my boss at a couple other places. And I got connected with her through someone from AU's cousin. <laughs> so, and she basically has helped me um, make a lot of connections within this field. Um, I think networking or connecting can be really uncomfortable sometimes. Um, and you can feel like embarrassed, like I feel embarrassed all the time sometimes when I write emails. I'm like, oh God, like I hope that's okay. But um, it usually turns out fine. I think um, a lot of people like stroking their ego is can always be helpful too. You know, if, like Vishal said, if you mention something that they've done, I think they'll immediately tune in and um, pay attention to what you're saying because it has to do with them. Um, but I think that I feel like my network has been really valuable both in finding a job and also in helping me hire um, people for my team. I think people always want to know that someone is, um, like it's, a, as a designer, it's easy to prove your skills by your visual work, but um, it's important to know that you're like vetted as a human being. So I think having, um, you know, having a network is really important for that, knowing that, um, okay, this person knows them, they said they're, fun, they're normal, so we can hire them. Um, so again, that's something that kind of transcends interviews because um, you don't necessarily know how someone comes across um, in an interview. And um, I think having, again, like um, maybe not necessarily looking for something, not necessarily looking for a job, but just wanna connect for an informational meeting um, 
I think can be helpful too, so that you're in the back of someone's mind. And then the next time they are hiring, they'll remember you. Um, and I, I think that's it. I think that answered. Thank you. Um, there's definitely a parallel between auditioning and interviewing and putting yourself out there and feeling um, vulnerable. <laughs> and Vishal, I love the way that you phrased, um, it's not rejection, it's just you didn't get the job if you don't if you don't get the job. So I wonder if all of you have tips um, for maintaining energy, excitement, positivity, um, taking time to check in with yourself when you're in the midst of trying to change jobs or find that next gig. Um, how, do you, how do you keep yourself going and what advice would you share to people who are getting ready to, or have already started this journey? Um, I think a big thing is uh, leaning on your friends, I would say are the, is the, the first thing I would <laughs> recommend, um, which is hard right now in this time of physical distancing, but obviously we have things like Zoom and other ways that we can reach out to each other. Um, but making sure that you have uh, some sort of partnership with somebody who can make you laugh at the mistakes you make or the perceived things that are perceived to you as mistakes or vulnerable moments um, is so important to be able to laugh at this experience. Um, job searching, it just often feels like you are uh, walking down a long, long hallway where every door is closed and has a different key to open. And it's, um, and, and that can really uh, drain your energy very quickly. Um, and so having some um, rituals that you do every day where, you know, you check your job boards, you see if anything new has been posted, you check your email, you check your contacts, reach out, do that for an hour or so in the morning, send out some resumes for another hour or two, and then let it go for the rest of the day. Um, give yourself a break because you're going to drain yourself very, very quickly if you try and do that for 12 hours a day. Um, and what do you do in the rest of the day? Um, I would recommend working on personal projects that are keeping your mind honed, keeping your skills honed, furthering um, ideas that you might have for the field. One of the things that always inspires me when we're interviewing new um, potential hires is when they have some sort of personal passion project that they're able to share that they're that they've been working on or have completed and can share with us um, it just really shows that initiative um, and is a great illustration of the skills and um, ideas and energy that we're usually looking for um, for our staff so keep keep making keep creating whether that's writing whether that's um, uh, performing, whether that's, um, I don't know, whatever it is for you, whatever your, your project could be. Um, keep doing it. Yeah, I, um, to add to what Mia said, I think it's important to take breaks um, because it can be draining and doing something that is like tangentially like helpful for your, for your search or for your skills is helpful. Um, and I think it's also helpful. There is a chance that you'll have a few months where you're looking for a job. And so it's important that you're able to um, answer when someone asks what you've been up to the past few months. And you can have some talking points like, I, I was really working on my website. And this is what came of it. Or I've been really interested in learning animation. I'm just speaking to my field, but um, even things that you might be curious about that don't relate, um, you know, literally to your job, I think would be super helpful so that people know that you're self-motivated and that you um, are constantly interested in learning new things. Because um, I think more than just your work experience, those things are really valuable too. Yeah, I have definitely had my share of slumps. Um, like every couple of years I go through like a period where I'm like, I don't know how I'm gonna make things work. I don't know where my next job is. 
Is this the end of my performing career? All of those big questions that some of you might have now. Um, and I would say that you should like give yourself the grace of like allowing those big feelings to happen, but also make sure you're taking the time to go out and live your life as a human too, because your job is obviously very important, but it does not and should not define you. So making sure you're still a person while you're job searching will also ensure that you're still a person while you have a job so that your job doesn't take over your life. Thank you. Um, I've been trying to monitor the conversation as we go and taking notes to, to make sure we're going along, but I see that we do have a, a question that's coming in. So I think it is probably a good time to um, transition and let our audience know that we will open up. If you have questions, go ahead and type those in. Um, and if you don't at the moment, I've got a few more to ask as follow up. But this one that comes in from Sherry, um, who has a specific question for you, Sarah, she says, as a recent graduate junior product designer, how can we stand out in the current situation, especially with so many talents free in the market now? Uh, hi, Sherry. Thank you for your question. Um, I think the biggest practical thing is having a website that's functional that can showcase your work. Um, I think it sounds pretty obvious, but um, sometimes I go to people's websites and I simply can't navigate them. And so I click away. So that's like number one. Um, and I think just being um, open-minded to different kinds of opportunities. It seems like right now there's a little bit more um, opportunity for remote work and freelance work. So I, it seems like that would be great. Um, and then just, just being aware of like the creative um, networking sites. Um, there's working, not working is a big one. Um, and I think also, looking, I, the first thing I look at is someone's Instagram, because as a visual person, yeah, that's where a lot of people, you know, maintain their aesthetic. So um, that's not a role at all. But um, any sort of way you can put your work out there, um, so that it's easy to get a sense of your skills it would be really helpful. Okay, thanks, Sarah. And welcome, Professor Kipala. <laughs> I, I am so, so sorry uh, for being uh, crazy late. Uh, I was sitting in a dentist chair for a very long time, which was super fun and, and, uh, and wonderful to see you, Mia and, and Vishal and, and Sarah. And, hi. We just uh, wrapped hi. up kind of the formal. Your teeth look great. <laughs> teeth look great. We just wrapped up the kind of the formal openings um, where people were sharing from um, their own experiences and, and just kind of giving tips for getting through. And we have opened it up to um, questions from the audience at the moment. Uh, we have one that just came in from Emily. She says, as a student interested in arts education, what can you say to someone who loves the arts but is mainly concerned with financial stability? Um, valid concern. Um, good question. Um, I would say there are a lot of opportunities in arts education, um, but given our current circumstances, it's going to start being carved out very differently. Um, and so using this opportunity to take stock of your skill sets, your ideas, your um, network is uh, what I would recommend doing right now. Uh, it's an interesting time to be going into arts education because there's two primary avenues that is to become a formal certified arts teacher in some way. Um, but then the teaching artist field is also um, becoming more and more recognized as a valid workforce um, and it's becoming professionalized in a sense. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities for that more kind of arts education 
education in community arts settings, as well as uh, through nonprofits such as the one that I work for, um, to go into school settings uh, without being a certified licensed arts full-time arts teacher. Um, that is, of course, looking different now that we are transitioning to remote and online learning. Um, the landscape looks different depending on the district or state that you are in. Um, we're starting to see a lot of headlines talking about um, layoffs for licensed arts teachers in schools, which is devastating. Um, if you are a social activist in any way, reach out to your legislators. It's really, really important to make sure that we're not repeating the mistakes of past and saying that more time on academics equals better learning. We know that's it's not true. Um, with uh, lots of research that the arts are a vital part of um, raising well-rounded um, youth. Um, sorry for that little soapbox, um, but all of that is to say that I actually think there are a lot of opportunities in the arts education field. Um, and, and it's just gonna continue to look different and figuring out those online skills are, um, have always been important, but even, even more so, um, especially reaching out to nonprofits and community arts organizations. They're very interested in additional ideas uh, and, um, workforce uh, skill sets that can be assisting in that transition. Yeah, and I would say that it, it may take a while to build up your, your arts education career anyway. Um, so, you know, give yourself that sort of grace that you don't have to like have one big job. It could be many different jobs, as Mia said, 11 different jobs upon graduating. Um, you know, I basically have three different roles in my life. I have my performance career, I have my teaching career, my private voice studio, and then I have the arts education work that I do for the nonprofit I work with. And it took me really till the past year to figure that out. So, you know, you might not be able to do it all at once, but you have time, time is actually on your side, you are young yet. So, you know, it might mean doing two other things part time while you start to teach, or find an organization that you align with and intern for them or whatever that path may be, just getting started and getting that ball rolling. Um, you know, my philosophy is like, get busy and then change the busyness to be your ideal version of busy. Um, advice yeah okay um i've got all of a sudden three more questions have popped in here and um vishal you're quite popular uh so <laughs> get ready <laughs> they're coming your way um the first is uh these there's two questions in a row from uh graciela the first is how did you approach building your own voice studio and teaching experience yeah, that, hi Graciela. Um, that, I was actually lucky. People kind of started coming to me. Um, and, you know, I've been in New York for eight years now and I've been performing. I've met a lot of people and um, I've sort of actually through Instagram have created this sort of niche following of pop rock singers and have become one of the people people seek out. Um, and the big shift for me um, was sort of, I guess, validation, which is, you know, you should validate yourself. But, uh, <laughs> but I had a, a big uh, guru in the pop rock world, uh, this woman, Sherry Sanders, who wrote the book on auditioning, interviewed me to be in her book last year. Um, so that was sort of, and she was like, you should teach. So I sort of, decided i had already been doing it uh periodically but i decided to sort of give it a go and i'm still learning i think in a weird way teaching has given me the permission to continue being the student i always should have been um so did that answer the question i hope <laughs> we'll also throw in there, I have seen Vishal put out on his social media, on Instagram, um, flyers and notifications on workshops that he's going to lead, some of them being, you know, 
fee or registration, but some of them just kind of being like, this is what it looks like when I teach. So he promotes himself and his work as well. Yeah, and I have, I, I, you know, I've been doing Zoom sessions, so I'll ask occasionally to record those so that I have things to show. Like, I'm trying to now uh, break into more like university teaching settings. Um, so I have done that. Yeah, thanks, Maria. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the, the next question that Graciela had ties in with a question that Isabel submitted. So I'm going to read them both because they're very close, closely related. Uh, with auditions moving online through self tapes, is there a way to build a personal connection that might be similar to the one that you can build in person? Because it feels like the connection could be easily lost through a virtual submission. And Isabel's question is, are you seeing actors create content at home and if so, how are they sharing it? And what is the standard right now for working actors? Mm, the standard. Well, I guess I'll just tell, I'm a little sweaty here because my AC is too loud. So I turned it off. Um, the standard is, yeah, everything's online right now. Um, I have seen a shift in sort of more like concert work, um, which I mean, I mostly do musical theater. So when Broadway shut down, I was in the middle of rehearsals for a show at New York City Center. And we were supposed to open the next week. And we were in the middle right before our big run through before we moved into the theater. The trucks had all come with the set. Everything was loading in. The city shut down. Um, and within, by the end of that afternoon, my whole work for the end of the, till the end of the year had um, been canceled things that I've been working on. Um, you know, I, 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 my big passion is developing new work. So th this was the only really in the, the recent, it recently has that sort of come to fruition. All the things that I've been helping develop are actually coming into production. So it was kind of a bummer for that reason. Um, these were projects I was really excited about and they felt really meaningful. Um, but I think in everything transitioning to online, video auditions are definitely, um, they've, they've, the dog, they've been, um, been important, but, uh, I think now that everything is digital, um, the way you can create that personal connection, hmm, I would say that, well, if you're auditioning for someone, you know, just make sure when you're sending in your auditions that you're making sure to stay personal, to keep that personal touch on your emails. As far as the audition itself, you kind of want to let the work show. Um, you want to make sure, you know, this is a really great time I see in all of my students and in myself because theater and film and TV are not happening right now. This is a really great time to just work on the craft, to work on the craft. It's sort of, the, the joy that I've found that I haven't had for 10 years and I'm like, oh my God, I can just run a scene with a friend for fun, like when I was in college. So that the things you might be doing now, keep doing them, keep that, keep that fun. And yeah, there is content um, being created. There's a lot of concert work I've been doing. Um, I was just saying I'm about to do a, a, um, a play festival called the Pride Plays that Michael Yuri, um, if you know him, he produces. And so we're going to be rehearsing this week um, and putting that on tape. I've been doing concerts uh, for different new musicals. Um, it's a mixture of sort of live things, things that seem live, uh, and then things that are already sort of curated. Um, but I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I, th I think also because um, uh, you were sort of asking what the, the standard has become. And I think right now there really is not a standard. Um, uh, everybody's sort of finding their own way. And I think um, one of the things that's important is not relying purely upon, yes, the work has to speak for itself in the audition video, but outside of the audition video, you should be looking to make um, connections, personal connections with the people who are reaching out to you to audition. Um, and just like sort of Mia pointed out in a lot of Vishal's other work, um, Vishal is very good at self-promoting in a way that's not obnoxious. Um, 
and, um, and, and reaching out to people um, so that he is developing personal relationships and not necessarily with the overt obvious goal of I am doing this so that I can find work, but just because of, wow, you're another interesting theater person. I, I'm interested in what it is you are doing. I'm interested in your seasons, what you produce. Um, and I'd like you to, tell, to share sort of what's going on with me. And this is what I'm doing right now. And here's an example or inviting people. Um, that, that sort of networking that you would be doing normally and trying to do in person, now you need to figure out how you to do it virtually and still make it work. Um, and not just sort of sit back and tape your stuff and assume that that's going to be enough. That's, that's a great uh, transition to some of the other questions that have come in and tying back to what we were talking about earlier, relation, uh, networking as relationship building or, or connecting with people that it is a two-way street. Um, you're not just doing it with something in mind for you, but there is a role that you play in potentially giving back to the person that you're reaching out to. Um, one great phrase I heard as all of this was happening um, and everybody was worried about um, where, where job opportunities would go and how to connect with people is when you reach out to somebody, ask if you're looking for a job, ask for advice. Because if you ask for a job, you'll only get advice. So ask for advice and that could lead to a potential job opportunity. Um, so going back to some of these networking related questions um, for all of the panelists. Um, let's see which one we have. Uh, April has said, I'm pursuing a career in museum administration, but I'm unsure how to send cold emails seeking opportunities I, and I know that many nonprofit organizations are struggling right now. Is there a good way to do this? Um, well, one thing I can offer is if you would like to email me, I have some folks that I can introduce you to who are also working in museum administration. I'd be happy to put you in touch. Um, when making an, e an email uh, connection or a phone call connection with somebody who you don't know, it's really, really important to have researched and looked at that institution specifically before you are talking to them, have specific aspects that you are interested in, know how to share your own personal narrative about where you are coming from and why you are interested in their organization as well. Um, because you don't know each other and you wanna be building that personal um, connection. Um, so being ready to be as specific as possible with what it is that you are hoping to do. And I know that's really, really hard because you're just graduating. Like, what do you want to do? Nobody knows. Um, but try and have a couple ideas of something you might say about why you're interested in talking with them. What are some questions that maybe they could answer for you? Um, and know that it may be a short conversation. In fact, uh, expect it to be 30 minutes tops because if it goes on too long, it's going to like get awkward and stretched out. And just because it gets it's short, you've made that connection. So if a more specific question comes up, know that you can reach out to them again. Um, I actually love that when I have these informational interviews with people who are reaching out interested in my work. We have a short conversation that's introductory and then I hear from them again a few weeks later. Um, like, oh, they're really interested in this and they're really um, trying to learn more and, and stay in touch and I'm going to give them more of my investment and more of my time. Um, another great question, kind of piggybacking off of what uh, Nathan and Carl were talking about earlier, um, it's kind of a bold move, but I thought it was pretty cool when people have done this with me. Um, they've asked me at the end of our conversations, do you have any colleagues that you um, suggest I reach out to who might be um, able to further answer some of my questions? Um, and really, really bold, maybe even if the call went well, asking would you be willing to introduce me to them or make a, an email connection. Um, so just an opportunity to kind of further that process of um, networking or as we've decided connecting or relationship building instead. Um, I think I can put my email in the chat box. Would that be useful or 
Um, if, if you're willing to share your email, I can make that connection afterwards. And that goes for any of you. Um, if you are willing to, to share your email, we'll share it out with the participants today. Um, and I'll also point out for participants today that this session is being recorded, so you'll be able to access it again afterwards if you want to go back and listen to what Mia just said again, uh, so you didn't miss all that. Um, I think there was a lot of great tips there. When networking, sometimes people will naturally go there and offer to do that for you. And if they don't, it's okay to ask. The worst they can say is, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, and that ties into one of the other questions. So I think you, you answered part of that, but I'm just going to read the question again. Um, insights on job referrals relating to networking. Any tips on how to start the conversation about asking for a job referral during networking? So Mia, you were specifically talking about connecting to other people. Um, this relates to that. Sometimes it's easier to make a connection to a person than a, than a job referral, but I wonder if you had any reactions to that or, or any of the rest of you as well. Yeah, I think one way to kind of soften it and make it a little bit more comfortable than just kind of being like, do you have a job for me? Um, is saying, I'm really interested in getting into this field. Um, how did you get started? But also, do you know of any opportunities to, um, to get my foot in the door? Um, so it's not asking like, do you have a job that you can give me right now? Um, but saying like, I'm very interested in this field. This is where my passion lies. Um, do you have any advice or leads that I might be able to follow on to enter into this work with you? And I think, I, I think a couple of things that, 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 uh, that Mia said, I think are also really, really particularly useful. I mean, um, the, the idea of, of making sure when you connect with somebody that you're connecting with them as an individual, that you have done your research. Um, and so it's not just um, dear sir or madam. Um, this is sort of, so that it really is specific to them and that you are finding what your, how do your passions intersect in some way with the passions of this individual or this organization. Um, so, and, and, and again, something Mia just said, the, the idea of asking them to talk about their story um, how they got into it, what they are passionate about, what drives them. Um, it is a way of establishing a personal connection, which um, hopefully is not just purely predatory of, I'm doing this in, so that you will help me, but that, wow, you're a really interesting person and you've kind of gotten to some place that I would like to see myself. How did you do that? And so that it becomes a personal connection, which is sort of what you're looking for in the first place. Yeah, and uh, there's just two lingering questions in the, the chat right now. I'm looking at the clock um, that we'll wrap up after these two questions. We'll, we'll move into wrap up mode. Um, these are also both directed at you, Vishal. Um, somebody who, uh, Hugh graduated with a major in theater performance, and it seems to me like jobs in the theater have pretty much disappeared overnight. How have you been finding jobs in theater? Or if you have not been, how are you using your theater education to get employment in other areas? Um, relatedly, Drew asks, as you mentioned, lulls in your acting career besides teaching in your voice studio. Are there other common ways for New York actors to make money and stay connected to theater during acting lulls? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I still will occasionally, um, I do my like favorite side job is I, I'm a proctor for standardized tests, um, which I love because I'm very unfocused and it helps me just have my own, like I think of them as office hours for myself. So now they're kind of being done virtually through the company I work with, but typically that's what I've done. I've catered, I've, uh, catering is a big one, although you can't really do that right now. That's the reason it's been really hard on artists is not only are the jobs gone, but all the jobs we did to get while we were ma to make enough money to pursue the other jobs are also gone. Um, the catering companies I've worked with in New York, one of them is still, they've sort of transitioned into meal delivery for elderly, the elderly in this current climate. Um, so, you know, as they are pivoting, maybe finding ways that you can join up with those uh, typical day jobs, I guess. Um, 
But yeah, I've definitely had a little, sorry, let me look at the question. I'm a totally a visual guy. Oh no, the questions are gone. Oh no, they're right here. Uh, I just like to visualize them. And then... Would you like me to paste it in the, if you can't, can you see it? Jump in for a second for you, Vishal, while you collect your, your thoughts. Um, I think it's really important to be thinking about your work in very creative terms. Um, nothing looks the same as it did before. Um, and we have to kind of find these ways to find new opportunities in this uh, unusual time that we're in. Um, and going online with that, with that work, there are still a lot of arts projects being done that you can get involved in and that you can be creating yourself. And as we were talking about before, continuing those projects, um, what's interesting right now is institutions are stopped in their tracks, but individual artists are rising to the top in terms of what they're able to produce and get that out there. And it's having a lot more visibility than has ever been the case before in the kind of arts field because that is what is agile and flexible and able to uh, adapt as quickly as possible to these times. So keep creating. Also, um, I have a friend who works in costume design who uh, could not get a job in costume design when they first graduated and worked in retail. Um, and actually, when reflecting upon their career, realized that those those years spent um, dressing and shaping mannequins actually taught them a lot about the human form and about kind of those shapes and expressions um, that go along with clothing. Um, so capitalize on the moment. Delivering food um, in a pandemic to elderly, you can learn things about interacting with um, all sorts of different people and systems that will potentially fuel you in ways you won't recognize until later. Um, so do things you don't expect that uh, you never expected that you would say yes to and, and say yes. Yeah, and that can be hard. Um, but I think if you look at it as, yeah, as still a way to be creative versus I'm not doing the thing that I thought I wanted to, or that I, you know, want to do, um, you just never know what might happen and what connections you might make because, you know, that's the thing about a lot of sort of, as we call them in the arts world, like the side hustles or the day jobs is that those are all creatives. Everyone doing those jobs are creative. So you never know, you know, where you might meet people. You could be, even if it's volunteering, there are so many ways to be creative and maintain that and to pivot. Um, yeah. Thank you, uh, Mia and Vishal have kind of done some nice closing thoughts here. Uh, Sarah, as you've listened to them um, and, and thinking of the perspectives they have in, in the arts community versus your position, do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share? Or I'd like to add to what they've already shared. Sure. Um, I think just to add to what they were saying, uh, it's really important to be open-minded. I think um, you might have a de an idea for yourself of how you want things to go, but it's probably not going to happen right away. Um, so just kind of opening your mind to what you could do and how literally any experience you have is going to be helpful um, for your growth whether it's creatively or personally. Um, if you hate something, you'll learn from that. If you love something, you'll learn from that. So I think it's just really um, kind of embracing any opportunity that you get. Nicely said, thank you. And Professor Kippola, do you have any closing thoughts, words of wisdom, advice for our viewers today? I mean, I think, uh, in, in the limited amount I was able to hear. The, um, I, th I think the idea of, of um, figuring out how to couple together a, a life in the arts right now is even more important than it is usually. And it's usually quite important. Um, of figuring out how do, you, how do you explore different interests and passions and figure out how to reach out to the world in ways that are going to sustain you financially, um, but also emotionally and artistically. Um, and it, it may end up taking you into uh, directions that you would not have anticipated. 
And so I think the more open you are to the experience, it's far better to be out and exploring and experimenting and giving stuff a try than sitting at home in front of your computer. Um, unless sitting at home in front of your computer is the way that you're doing it, which of course right now is happening a lot. Um, but, but, um, but not allowing yourself to be passive. That never works for a career in the arts, but now it is even more crucial. And um, I think it's because uh, so much is uncertain for everybody. Everybody is going through that same struggle. So there's a sense of community, even with people who have been in the arts for a decade or multiple decades, everyone is going through a similar struggle now, which on some level is gonna help them connect more to who you are right now than they have been able to do for a long time uh, because they are going through that similar feeling of, I don't know what I'm gonna to do tomorrow or next week or next year. Um, and that's, um, and that's, I think, one thing that is to your benefit. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for giving us your time today and sharing your experience and advice um, for our viewers. You've heard many of them talk about changing jobs multiple times, and uh, I'll give another plug for the Career Center. Um, to change jobs multiple times, often you need to be able to update your resumes and cover letters quickly, uh, to submit things quickly, and we are here to help you do that and to learn those skills and develop those skills so when you go off and are doing that more regularly, you've got foundational skills to go from. So again, we are here, we are open. We're all virtual, all appointments uh, are virtual. We're doing more uh, webinars starting next week on job searching during a recession. Um, so stay tuned for that. The recording of this webinar will be made available on our YouTube channel. And also we will post a specific link to it on our uh, homepage under events. Um, and for those of you who, in, who participated live, we will send some follow-up information to you via the chat. Um, thank you again, or via, via email, I'm sorry. Thank you again to all of our panelists. And uh, Sam, I think we will go ahead and wrap it up. Take care, everyone. Thank you.